Hi, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, we're just a minute after time. Um, thank you all for coming. We have people uh, joining us gradually. Um, we're so thrilled that you're able to join us today. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Exchange Place. This is an event hosted by Public Art Exchange. Uh, it is the, also the fourth edition of Exchange Place, which has been an ongoing program of Public Art Exchange. The intent of Exchange Place is to engage members, also offer the opportunity um, to share five-minute presentations on a range of interesting public art topics with voices from around the country. I am Kelly Pajek. I'm the Director of For Culture Public Art. I'm joining you from Seattle, which is in King County, Washington, uh, the, and also the ancestral and unceded land of the Coast Salish people. Um, I'd also like to thank my wonderful colleagues who spent a great deal of time planning and organizing today's event. Laura McDermott, uh, the Executive Director of the Laramie Public Art Coalition in Laramie, Wyoming, and also Renee Pachaki, um, artist and public art consultant who's joining us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, before I hand things over to Laura and our exciting range of speakers today, I just wanted to share a little bit about Public Art Exchange for those of you who may be new or attending um, this event for the first time. Uh, Public Art Exchange is an open network. It's for those who are interested in or involved in the public art field. Uh, our goal is to create an inclusive platform for engagement and dialogue and allow for connection in the field by utilizing resources, discussion forums and events like this evening's exchange place. If you are new to Public Art Exchange, know it's a grassroots effort. It is all volunteer run and relies on involvement from our thousand plus members. Any member of Public Art Exchange who has ideas for programming, um, ways to lead dialogue, and also connect to others in the network are encouraged and welcome to do so. Uh, we would suggest you either please attend a monthly Public Art Exchange meeting to share your ideas. Those are usually held every second Monday of the month at 5 p.m. So basically this time of the month, um, 5 p.m. monthly, or reach out to the programming committee by using the Public Art Exchange platform on Mighty Networks. Also, since Public Art Exchange is an open forum and volunteer run, it does rely on contributions to keep programming like this going. So if you are able, we encourage you to make a contribution, and you can do that at Venmo, which is, and then our tag is the at symbol, public art exchange. Um, if you do this, know that any amount helps and we thank you for that. Um, with that, I would like to hand things over to Laura. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm so excited to be here with you all this evening. I am going to be the MC as we move through speakers this evening. So how this is going to go is everybody who is presenting tonight has five minutes to go through a very exciting public art topic of their choice that they're gonna be presenting to you all. And I will be timing that. And if they hit their five minutes before they're done, they're going to get this applause sign. <laughs> Look at this view, come on. <laughs> so everybody can cheer, maybe send emojis. Um, we'd encourage you all to stay muted um, during these presentations. We'll have a little bit of time at the end um, if we all wanna connect, but maybe you can add some things to the chat, um, questions and, Congratulations to the amazing speakers that we have lined up for you all tonight. So we are going to get started. I'm vamping a little bit here. Um, for our first speaker, who will be Angela Anderson Adams, who is the director of Arlington Public Art in Arlington, Virginia. So Angela is sharing her screen and we will get your timer started, Angela. So here we go, three, two, one. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Angela. Yes, unmute. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, imagine, it's 1979. Three years ago, you completed a project which drew attention to the changing seasons and vast sky above the land you purchased in Utah's remote Great Basin Desert. This would come to be known as your magnum opus. 
Invitations for new projects appear, primarily for discrete sculptures, including one for a yet-to-be-designed park in Arlington, Virginia. You never lost sight of the desire to shape the experience of encountering your artwork, like you did in Utah, to make it a destination worthy of a pilgrimage. This might be the chance to do it again. You ask if you can expand your vision over two roadways to include a, a Virginia Department of Transportation traffic island to the south. How about to the north as well? There are plans for an office building there, but like the park which, you, which will host your sculpture, it has yet to be designed. Maybe the park can interact with this building or stand in its, on its own as an equally significant gesture. Although local and federal government is footing the bill this time, maybe you can bring celestial meaning to an otherwise forlorn half acre of public land. After all, Is it advancing? Is it advancing? It is not advancing. Oh, goodness. Oh, boy. There we go. Yeah, I don't know that it's going to work. Huh. Oh, here. There we go. There you go. After Perfect. all, you are Nancy Holt. Dark Star Park took five years to plan and construct. It was built of mounded earth, poured in place concrete, and landscaping. As general contractor, Holt assembled a team that included a swimming pool company. They devised unique methods to form the spheres, including custom-made wooden half meridians. To coat the spheres, they used a spray gun to concrete uh, a concrete application known as gunite. A triangular shape with two parks resulted, comprised of an eventually shaded north side at the bottom and a sunny side to the top. The park has both a passive and an active component. Holt's vision for Dark Star Park was reliant upon time. It took 20 years for the trees to grow large enough to produce shade and the ground cover to establish itself on the mound. On the north side, you enter through a tunnel, not unlike those Holt selected for Utah's sun tunnels. Your view is framed and directed to three large spheres in the distance. Two spheres are perched at the edge of reflecting pools. A third is positioned on the grass nearby. Holt likened them to fallen ex extinguished stars. Loose bluestone gravel coats the asphalt walkways, gently giving way underfoot. Holt didn't want a hard surface. This was to signal as soon as you entered the park that the environment had changed, as if to say, pay attention. The willow oak canopy over your head covers portions of curved walls that rise to a comfortable height, inviting you to sit down. Once you do, you notice that the lush landscape offers a cool and soothing oasis from the heat and humidity of mid-Atlantic summers. On the sunny side, you notice a curious arrangement of two spheres and four poles positioned at a perpendicular angle to shadow patterns on the ground. Here, Holt once again was thinking about time. Each sunny August the 1st at approximately 9.32 a.m., a solar performance takes place when actual shadows cast by the spheres and poles align with the shadow patterns on the ground. This marks the day in 1860 that William Henry Ross acquired the farmland he named Rosalind. Each year on August the 1st, our Rosalind neighborhood gathers to celebrate, sometimes dressed in tie-dye in honor of Grateful Dead musician Jerry Garcia's birthday, and always to watch. Dark Star Park not only serves as a celebrated civic gathering spot, but also as a model for how we approach county-initiated public art projects. We look to public-private partnerships for the planning and funding of our major efforts, and we encourage artists to lead the design of our public parks and infrastructure. 30 years later, we invited Walter Hood to design the one and a half acre John Robinson Jr. Town Square in the Green Valley neighborhood. This was funded in part through an Our Town grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, contributions from local real estate developers, and Arlington's Capital Improvement Program, the same funding model as Dark Star Park. This was also the first time since Nancy Holt asked if she could design the whole of Dark Star Park that we were able to offer a similar opportunity to another public artist. We strive to continue this process today. Yay, Angela! <laughs> nice job! 
<laughs> Perfect. Perfect timing. All Yay. right. Great. Uh, our next presenter is Savona Bailey McLean, the executive director and chief curator at the West Harlem Art Fund in New York City. And we'll get your presentation here. And we'll start the clock. Three, two, one. Laura, am I supposed to be sharing? You are. Okay, You're sorry. Let me start it from the real. Okay. <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> okay, how's that? It's good. All right, let's okay. go. <laughs> Savona, can we can you unmute yourself? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Savannah Bailey McLean. Uh, as uh, Laura was uh, sharing, I am the executive director of the West Harlem Art Fund in New York City. Harlem Sculpture Gardens will be the largest outdoor sculpture exhibition in the history of Harlem. Um, is the slideshow on a timer? Hello? Yeah, it's supposed to be. Okay, um, it's not advancing. Oops, I'm just gonna try to do that for you. Okay, great. Uh, so this will be the largest outdoor sculpture exhibition in the history of Harlem. It's co-presented by my <laughs> organization and New York Artists' Equity Association. Uh, we dedicate this project to the late artist Augusta Savage, and the power couple, Jacob Lawrence and Gwendolyn Knight. Personally, I wish to dedicate this exhibition to my grandmother and mother who came up during that black migration. As you can see uh, from the presentation deck, our venues include three historic parks, one park plaza, three monument sites, and one college campus a total of eight sites. The demographics of our 28 artists are nine African-American artists, five Latino artists, two Asian artists, and 12 Caucasian artists. Uh, you can keep moving the, the slideshow. It just, it's meant to just continuously move. Uh, we have 10 new works being presented. We have two artist partnerships, two galleries presenting artists, and two not-for-profit organizations also presenting. In addition to this, to make the exhibition uh, more accessible as well as immersive, we have partnered with the application story, S-T-Q-R-Y. They uh, create these um, tours for various arts organizations. For our particular uh, project, we're using geofencing technology. So using GPS coordinates for all of our sculptures, we will then connect with the app. Folks can download the app for free. And when they walk towards any of the sculptures, it will open up into their phone. And therefore, they'll get to hear artists talk and introduce their works. They'll get to see additional images. And so they'll get to learn about the artists more intimately as well. To also engage the public more, as well as the local community, we have confirmed two floral designers to flower bomb several of the art installations for opening day, which will be May 2nd. So we're right around the corner. We've also partnered with the Contemporary Art Fair 154 New York, which means one continent, 54 nations. So therefore we're making it a little bit more international, bringing in the diaspora from the United States, Caribbean and the continent. 
The other thing we learned about doing this project was that we needed to develop a resiliency plan. Climate change is real, far more real than many of us can imagine. And we discovered that all of our parklands from Central Park going to the top of the island is on a fault line. And because we've had so much excessive rain, it's actually shifting the landscape. So we reached out to City College School of Architecture, several other groups who have been working with us. And so we've put a coalition together. So therefore we can deal with soil erosion, soil compaction and flooding. So therefore in the future, these available public lands would be good for other public temporary art. We've also scheduled a seed bombing, which we're doing for the first time this coming Sunday. We're also planting native uh, species plants. So therefore we can keep the soil together. All of this in an effort so therefore we can have future outdoor exhibitions. We do not have in Harlem a lot of galleries. Real estate has gotten so expensive, it makes it prohibitive. But we do have a lot of parkland. So we're creating galleries without walls. And we're also including monuments where a lot of money was spent to deal with traffic situations or to acknowledge women. So therefore, we can bring in both the past, the present, and make room for the future. And that's why we also included City College and their contemporary works as well. So the exhibition will run from May 2nd to October 30th. Thank you so much. Yay! <laughs> Great job. <laughs> All right, who's going with me to the May 2nd opening? Let's go. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next up, we have Stacy Levy, who is an artist from Spring Mills, Pennsylvania. Stacy, get your presentation up there. And I'll start the clock whenever you're ready. All right, here we go. Stacy, take it away. Stacy, you're muted. You're muted. Okay, Stacey. am I unmuted now? Okay, so I got yes. to work on a really cool new walkway um, in New York City, right on the top of uh, the East River. And, and why won't this go? I don't know why it's not moving. There we go. And I figured I get a chance to engage the river's amazing four foot tide or create some way for people to experience the river flowing past. But no, nothing could touch the water uh, or shade the water in any way. And it was really hard to let go of the desire to collaborate directly with the river. But the real kicker was that all the artwork had to be brought on by barge. And a barge costs about $1,200 a day. So how am I gonna get anything onto the site without breaking the budget? Meanwhile, I'm thinking about other aspects of the river that I could vivify, like who was living in it. And meanwhile, I also knew that all of New York City parks are paved with hexagon pavers. And when I think of hexagon paving, I think of this most wonderful public art, Gaudi's tiles, featuring fanciful sea creatures in Barcelona. And maybe instead of fanciful sea creatures, what if the actual living diatoms of the East River were to be celebrated? A kind of conceptual love child as if ecologist Rachel Carson and the architect Gowdy got together and created something. And maybe they collaborate on a hex paver that had a lyrical pattern and was very site specific in its scientific accuracy. So um, I realized if I created a design to fit in um, this very hex pavered spec for the site, then these artworks could be manufactured by the same company that was supplying all the pavers. And then I'd be able to cover about half a mile of park with art while only paying, kind of, only paying an upcharge to the base materials that were already spec'd. 
and my shipping would be covered and the art papers would ship in with the plain papers so I could really cover some ground. And I'm no stranger to making things to walk on, but I'm not a pattern maker at heart. And Gaudi's tiles are masterworks of beauty and pattern cohesion. I also had an ongoing challenge to make that pattern sustain the weight of a fire truck and work with the park's maintenance guidelines and be ADA compliant, which is only a quarter inch, and still be manufactured in bulk by a very unforgiving and not always sympathetic industrial process. I started by studying with microalgae specialists at NOAA and started um, putting the patterns to the pavers, creating models, working with the um, manufacturing over at their plant. I made a few design missteps like when I made a diatom that looked rather like the suddenly too familiar microorganism, coronavirus. So I had to go back to the drawing board and back to studying diatom populations in the river. And finally, after a lot of prototypes, I could finally get to a pattern that could be pressed using this absolutely gigantic 40-ton four ton press, which creates the pavers um, at Wausau's factory in Wisconsin. And in the end, the project spanned so much time that a landside connection finally got built. So I didn't actually need a barge. And I laid the forms out with chalk and chain, hose and paint based on patterns floating on the floating foam that I was looking at on the river, on the East River. And then the art pavers were placed on the asphalt surface. Each one had to be turned to make the connecting pattern work. And I was out on site each day, laying out and also carrying about a few hundred papers. I could only carry one, the guys could carry two and three at a time. There was my office with seagulls. And after a very long collaboration with Stantec Landscape Architects, the Parks Department, Masons and the Blessing of the Neighborhood Boards and with Emily Blumenthal, who's here, we have a half a mile of walkway enhanced with 5,000 diatome hex pavers which all work together to give this park a cohesive walking experience and a new way to view the otherwise invisible river life that's swimming and floating in the water surrounding the park. Shameless Commerce Division here. You can get a diatom necklace. And thank you very much. I think I've made it under time. You did, 37 seconds to spare, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Amazing job, Stacy. <laughs> All right, our next presenter is Ed Marquand from Tiet Tieton Mosaics. And am I saying that right, Ed? From Tieton? You are, yes, thank you. Awesome, all right. Well, we'll okay. get your am I, presentation. Am I sharing there? You are, Great. so I'll get you started. Okay, uh, I'm Ed Marquand, the owner and creative director of Tieton Mosaic. I've worked in the art world for four, over four decades, mostly collaboratively, which is essential for ambitious art projects. We started Titan Mosaic about a dozen years ago, and our first big commission was supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. The company's now taking on big and complex projects around the country. Titan is a small town in central Washington, and part of our success is because of our commitment to local workforce development and retention. Our mosaic services often include other types of fabrication in-house and subbed out. Although much of the work we do is of our own design, I'm gonna show you some examples of ways we translate other artists' concepts into finished mosaics. The outside artists we usually work with are not familiar with mosaic techniques, so the collaborations we take on are central to our studio. Christy Torado is a wonderful painter and printmaker. She received a National Endowment for the Arts grant to design two mosaics that we produced. This is about eight feet tall and is sited in a housing project. Here's a second of Christie's, her original painting on top of the printout we made from our vector files. The full-size cartoon is what we used as the guide for the mosaic production itself. Here's Christie's mosaic in production. We work in sections that are joined in the frame or in direct installation on the wall, floor, bench, or other surface. In our studio, we enjoy thinking about mosaic in ways that take advantage of technology to realize imagery that would be difficult to achieve otherwise. This design required firing airbrushed vitreous paint onto glass. Fortunately, a member of our team is a master airbrush artist and was able to replicate the vintage cartoon. Our largest commission to date was for Sound Transit in Seattle. We're finishing 27 mosaic murals, each 12 feet wide. The designs are from six artists. Lauren Eda's primary medium 
His large scale paper cut, her five mosaics, portray subtly changing rock, paper, scissors. The flow of the grout line contrasts with the simplicity of the black and white palette. Kenji Stoll thinks of himself as a tattoo artist first and a muralist second. With his five large pieces soon to be up in a high visibility sound transit location, we hope to work with him on more mosaics in the future. Kenji's inspiration for this series were ceramic protector gods on Japanese temples. This Cable Griffith piece for sound transit is a great example of thinking about mosaic unconventionally. They were direct translations of his paintings in flat glass. Cable used 34 different colors in his five mosaics. We were able to use some of the waste negative pieces from one mural as positives on the other. Until we figured out a good system to track all the shapes and colors, it felt like playing five simultaneous games of three-dimensional chess, but we figured it out pretty quickly. Angelina Villalobos's design started as paintings, which we transferred into vector files to include grout lines. We worked with artist Mary Iverson to create and install a mosaic around a column to be mounted into a decommissioned ski lift tower. The kinetic elements were beyond our abilities. She hired Dylan Works in Washington State to fabricate the piece. In this case, our team assembled, assisted Mary with the installation of the mosaic to the power, tower pole in the fabricator's studio. And this project was a great collaboration. Mary explained recently that she never expected to get the commission, but that when she did, it went so well, it's given her confidence to take her practice to a more ambitious level. We collaborated with the community around a popular park in Yakima, Washington to come up with 12 selfie stations. Many of the designs were generated by community members who then selected the ones we produced. The park didn't have wall surfaces, so we designed these standing selfie stations instead. In our shop, we often dummy up some of the structural elements to confirm details. So when we go to the structural engineer for stamped formal drawings, much of their work is already done which reduces prices. One of our friends and now permanent neighbors in Titan is the sound artist Trimpen. He has deep experience in taking on big projects that require fabrication. He's been a terrific resource for us. The uh, sharing of ideas and technical knowledge and the participation of others has always been rewarding for me and I hope it will be for you. And I hope we'll have opportunities to work with some of you. Thank you. Yay. Oh my gosh, I keep holding it upside down. Way to go, Ed! <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. 15 seconds to spare. You all are yeah. crushing it. <laughs> so exciting to see all of these projects. Our next presenter is Nick Hardigan, who is the Fine Arts Specialist with the United States General Services Administration. Nick. Ed, I think you have to stop sharing in order for Nick to be able to share. There you go. Y'all, yeah. right. yeah, what an exciting day. The eclipse and all of these amazing presentations. How lucky are we? <laughs> all right. We're pretty lucky. I know. Nick, how's Nick. it coming? Oh, I'm trying to, it, it is not letting me share here. Hmm. Is it saying, what is it saying to you? Uh, that Zoom can't access my photos. Oh, no. Uh oh. Do we want to, Laura, go ahead one and come back to Nick? I can do that. That's, that's a great idea. Thank you. I think we should. So he doesn't feel all that pressure. That's great. I love it. <laughs> love that idea. All right. Well, then our next presenter is China Whitby with the University Health Art Program from San Antonio, Texas. China. No, she's here. There she is. Hey, China.
the sharing working for you or is it also causing an issue there you go there we go all right i'm gonna start your five minutes once that comes up there it is are we hearing china not not yet what an exciting day of technological excitement <laughs> Every time I use Zoom, it's like new experience. So this is <laughs> this is good. Okay, China. He is unmuted. Yeah. We can't hear you. China, do you maybe have earbuds that are plugged in somewhere? Okay. Let's see. Can you? Yeah. Oh, we heard you for a second. Yeah, we can hear you. you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Can you hear you? Oh, you heard me? Yes. Yes. We okay. Hear yeah. You. Yes. Okay. I don't know what I did, but I'm glad it worked. Okay. I can hear you. Awesome. So I will now share okay. my screen. Okay. Perfect. Hopefully, you guys I was like, please work. You working earlier <laughs> always works when i don't want it to all right uh all right everyone my we're name is china with i'm super excited seeing, to share we're only seeing half your screen are you can you see it now no only half ah okay mm, what are you seeing now are you seeing the presentation? We're seeing, we're seeing five slides on the left and half of the and half of the slides. Are you seeing the full slides now? Full slides, but only half, only to the word salud, only to health. Oh, okay. Um, I think you need to make that box good. wider. Okay, let's see. It is. Is that better? No, that's worse. Now we're only no. seeing the logo, really. It's okay, that's, hmm, what is happening? Because it's showing up full on mine. Can you see it now? I think, no, I think what might be happening is you're only sharing a portion of your, your screen, and that is a, a, a vertical size box. Oh, how does that even work? Okay, let me try it again. Okay. Entire screen. You know what's so nice about Is it working now? Not yet. Is we've all done this, you know? So we're all just sending you a lot of love right now. <laughs> Is this showing up now as a full screen? No, Do there's nothing. Can you share it, maybe? Yeah, I think you need to share again. Okay. Allow. Okay. okay, what are you guys seeing now? It's almost it looks ready. Like it's loading. You seeing PowerPoint? You know what? I think you should stay with this. Don't Pardon? change anything. Oh, there you go. Oh, you go. You, go. Okay. you fixed it. Yay! Okay. Woo! All right. Oh my God, it was a Here we go. It was working earlier, but of course now it doesn't. Okay. So everyone, nice to meet you. I am the art program manager and archivist for Salute Arte, Art of Healing. And so today we'll be sharing with you guys um, about the history of our program. So we work um, at a level one hospital and a trauma facility in San Antonio, Texas. We range, um, we serve of all Bexar County. And so we're a level one trauma center. And so within our collection, well, we don't like to say collection, we say it's programming. I'm going to share with you how we incorporate art into a healing environment and the different phases that we work from. So within our collection, we have about 5,000 pieces and this is spread across a main medical campus, two downtown facilities, and then 26 um, auxiliary campuses. And we're growing at a, a crazy pace. 
So how we approach incorporating art is through three different phases, which is the first one, which is our design enhancement. And so for us, design enhancement means that it's incorporating art during the early building phases. And so we're locating um, waiting areas, just open open. Um, walls and open walkways and um, something um, like an elevator lobby would be areas for design enhancement where we're incorporating art um, and working with our art teams and designers. So we have an artist committee that we work with and then we'll bring in the different types of artists and then we'll work with things such as wall film, acrovan, because incorporating art into a medical facility um, requires a different set of stand, um, a different set of standards that we're working through and mainly focusing on sit, um, safety. Um, and so art here works as a, what we call wayfinding and what we call positive distraction. So waiting room, it allows that separation, but also allows you to get access to things such as light. And so these are examples from our women and children's hospital and then different waiting areas throughout our community. Next phase is our site specific. So site specific is where we designated um, key spots throughout our clinics to incorporate some form of public art. And so this piece is in our new Women and Children's Center, which is a one um, hospital, which is a 1.1 million square foot addition to our already three million, or two million square, square foot campus. And so these are images from the artist Mike Sebos that we worked with to install this piece into our new, what is our new main lobby, and then other art pieces such as this tree, um, this this tree um, called the. Um, Animal Kingdom, which represents mommy and baby birds. And so these are just the um, images with of us working with local artists to incorporate these pieces. And so we really like to reflect the community in which we serve. And so we don't just limit it to um, just San Antonio artists, but we do try to incorporate them as much as we can. And so going to our next phase, which is our procurement. So procurement, and when we get to this phase, it's just when we're purchasing art, um, straight art, this is, we're reaching, connecting with galleries, local artists, and bringing it in. And so everything that we do is museum quality and grade. So we have like um, a hanging system that we use, and then we use things such as OP3 Plexi to protect the art. As I said before, in total, we have about 5,000 pieces. Everything is cleated to the wall across our different campuses. And so this is just a small survey of some of the pieces we have. We include sculptures, paintings, um, visual artists as well and so coming into this last project was about keeping track of about 14 pieces of art um, making sure everything was tagged and hung within our standards and so the last thing that we do is staff on um, patient programming and so this this focuses on incorporating um, weekly programs. We do two pop-ups a week and bringing in local artists into the healing community, not just for our patients, but our staff as well. And this can come in the form of music, um, staff community projects. And we really let the artists focus on building their own program where they can set up for three hours each week across all of our campuses, as many as um, all of our different campuses, so we're just driving around and being on site and letting them lead that workshop. And sometimes they can take um, objects away and it really does allow our patients to experience a broad range of different art activities as a form of art therapy. And so we do about 60 of these programs a year. And so that is the end of my slide. Good job, China. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> it's a great job. Jenna. Sorry about the malfunctions earlier. No worries. It happens. This this is all all great. All right. So next up, we have Nick uh, Nick Hardigan, a fine arts specialist from the United States uh, General Services Administration. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick. Hey, this time with slides. Thank you, China. Uh, hey, good evening. I'm Nick Hardigan. I'm an art historian and fine art specialist with the U.S. General Services Administration, or GSA. Uh, we oversee the nation's largest public art collection. Um, our artworks are in every U.S. state and territory, except Delaware. Uh, and broadly speaking, we care for artworks in executive branch agencies and most U.S. federal courthouses, 
collection spans uh, nearly 160 years and includes two major bodies of work. So that's artwork made during the New Deal, which GSA, GSA is the owner of now, um, and our artworks from our art and architecture program. There's about 500 of those, uh, and we are commissioning more each day. I think there's about 24 coming up with the uh, recent infrastructure um, bill. I am part of the team that focuses on the art in and around Washington, DC. We are the smallest region geographically, um, but because of the concentration of federal workers and agency headquarters, uh, we hold the lar largest body of artwork, something like a third of the collection. And more broadly, the federal government owns something like 35% of the real estate in Washington, DC. So we have a lot of artworks uh, downtown uh, in and around our buildings. All of our artwork exists in public spaces. Uh, they're made for the public with public money and they lead very public lives. So this means like many of you, we care for artwork uh, that does not have the benefit of temperature controlled, uh, security protected gallery spaces. And because of this, we do an awful lot of conservation work. Um, specifically, uh, that's what I wanna talk about today is our conservation work on an artwork uh, named Route Zenith by the artist Keith Sonier. So in 1977, Sonia is commissioned to create an artwork for the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. Uh, he made Route Zenith here. The Reagan Building is the final, uh, the final building in the Federal Triangle highlighted there. The sculpture is now 27 years old. Um, this, was, this is a massive three-story uh, curtain wall construction, dozens and dozens of neon bulbs. Some, but not all of the bulbs have been replaced in that 27 year time span. Um, and the sculpture has been on, it's been turned on and illuminated uh, 24 hours a day, essentially nonstop um, with, with very few exceptions when we turn it off. Uh, paradoxically, at least for me, was learning that keeping the neon turned on actually prolongs its life. Uh, turning it on and off is one of the things that causes it to degrade. Um, so this is the issue. The crux of the matter is that neon has a limited lifespan. We know neon bulbs will not last indefinitely. They dim, they burn out. Um, and incidentally, the bulbs are not the first thing to fail. Uh, the transformers, oh, looks like my video is not showing up. That's okay. Uh, the transformers are the first thing to fail. Um, it's hard to see in this image, little uh, phone book sized uh, boxes hidden in that structure. Uh, they contain bitumen or aluminum and it starts to, they start to overheat, they start to melt. So we get a 250 degree melting asphalt dripping down uh, becomes a serious life safety concern. So we have to replace them. Um, as a program, uh, our mandate is to keep artworks in our collection alive forever, indefinitely for the American public. Um, we are in the forever business. We, we have to preserve this stuff. Uh, legally, we have to preserve this stuff. Um, and we know how to maintain oil paintings, frescoes, metal and stone sculptures, but neon's been a, a real challenge for us. Uh, so our strategy for approaching this was to first compile a list of all the Sonier sculptures that existed in the world. Uh, his estate claims he made 20 of these. I could find records of 16, uh, four of which were temporary. So there's 12 left. Of those 12, GSA owns two of them. Um, so we have a, a significant number of these artworks. I was really hoping somebody else would have solved this problem for us. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Um, we looked at the Whitney Replication Committee. Uh, the Getty Institute is currently working on best practices for conserving neon, uh, but it's not out yet. We did get some really good advice from a conservator named Taylor Healy, who's now at the Art Institute. Um, and I talked to everybody I could who owns one of these artworks. Our first choice was LEDs, um, but they were not at a point where they could convincingly replace the glow of neon. Uh, some of the other, other owners of these artworks have used um, uh, fluorescent bulbs, colored fluorescents, but those don't work here because the bulbs are all exposed. So fortunately, we were able to get in touch with Sonia's original fabricator, the person who was responsible for initially creating a lot of Sonia's artworks. And as of two weeks ago, uh, his team finished replacing each of the neon bulbs and their accompanying transformers. Uh, we optimistically hope to get another few decades out of this artwork, but we know our program will face this issue again, um, which is one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up and introduce it to you all today. Uh, you know, maybe in the future, LED technology will be at a place where it can satisfactorily replace these neon bulbs. Um, but I'm hoping uh, to sort of put it on everyone's public art radar and start a fruitful conversation for years to come. Yeah. All right, Nick. <laughs> we 
yeah, if anybody has some good neon tips, put those in the chat, start that conversation. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to welcome Jason Huff as our next presenter who is with the public art program in the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. So Jason, take it away whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, accepting my presentation here. I'm Jason Huff. I'm from the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. I am the program manager for the public art program, and I am here to talk about uh, some of our outreach strategies for our recent artist roster call. Oh, okay. And you can see my screen, right? Yes. I uh, got really small <laughs> on my screen. So, okay. Is, is the graphic working? We, we can see it. We can see like your whole screen with the, the slides. Uh, hold on, there we go. Okay, great. So Seattle Office of Arts and Culture has historically commissioned artists mostly through open calls. In 2013, our office developed a public artist roster where we could fast track selections when needed. Every three years we renewed our roster and with each renewal, we were slowly increasing the number of selections off the roster. During the pandemic in 2020, we commissioned several artists to create small fast track temper temporary projects that were all selected from the roster. And in our conversations with artists, we repeatedly heard that the open call process was too, con too time consuming and required way too much work. Receiving that feedback, we started to utilize our roster as a primary source of commissioning for commissioning artists. So they only had to apply once every three years for our projects. In 2021, we developed a webpage to allow other artists or others outside the city of Seattle to view our roster and who directly contact artists for commissions. Um, when we developed our 2024-26 roster, we made it a goal to increase the number of BIPOC artists on our roster and realize that our standard methods of outreach was not effective in reaching BIPOC and emerging artists. Given our limited res limited uh, communications resources, our public art team developed a strategy to a strategy for direct communication with BIPOC artists and community groups to help us get the word out to their friends and community about this opportunity. Um, we developed this graphic that was incorporated into all of our media outreach that emphasized the groups we prioritized. Next slide. Uh, oh, hold on a sec. Let me get the next slide. Um, we developed a pre-recorded video to assist artists with the application process that went live along with our roster call and held two online and two in-person workshops. We partnered with cultural organizations to hold additional workshops and asked them to assist us with getting the word out to their communities. Um, we connected, we contracted with three artists, Toka Valu, Andy Hinojos, Abraham Owalam, artists from the Pacifica, Latinx, and East African, Middle Eastern uh, communities, communities that we were focusing much of our attention on as far as increasing our numbers. Um, we paid each artist $500 to provide our office with written testimonials about their experience working with our office uh, that we blasted out on our social media channels. Each artist came up with their own plan according to how they felt would be most effective in reaching their communities and methods included hosting information workshops, used radio shows, uh, and conducted direct communications with members in their communities. So given all those efforts that um, we took on for this, here are the results. This is compared to our previous roster from uh, 2021, 20, 23. Um, and so we have an increase in BIPOC artists all across the board. Uh, and just note that uh, in 2021, artists could only select one race. Here they can do all races that apply to, uh, to them. And, you know, bar graph only kind of gives slices of pies of two different pies. Um, here are the actuals that we have for each one. So you can see like with native Hawaiian Pacifica community, you know, we had one back in 21. Now we have 19. Um, same with uh, Native artists, Middle Eastern, East African. So, yeah. And if you're interested in uh, viewing our roster, our last one, the new one won't be completed until June, but uh, it's a URL down there if you want to take a, 
a minute to copy all that or just go to our website and fish around for it. And that's it. I'm done. Awesome job. Uh, thanks, Jason. Yay. <laughs> Those are really amazing numbers. Thank you so much for sharing. So inspiring. Um, our next presenter is Maura Dwyer, who is an artist from Baltimore, Maryland. You out there. Yep. Um, let me just share my screen. Right. Um, okay. One second. Okay. Great. How's great. that looking? Looks great. All right, I'm gonna great. get this started. We're seeing it's great. like a little bit over. Yeah, I see that now. I'm gonna center it. Okay, perfect. All right, here we go. Great, yeah, so I'm, I'm coming to you from Baltimore City. I am. Uh, I was previously a public art um, administrator and now I'm a grad student focused on creative placemaking. So I wanted to talk about a project that was new and challenging for me, um, a bus shelter. I have a background as a public artist and an art educator. So going into the urban design field was uh, was interesting and a learning experience. And our lead artist who, uh, who we ended up with will be presenting for you tonight. So I'm excited to hear more about Bruce's project later this evening. Um, so I'll just go to our next slide. And Bruce is with Public Mechanics. Here's a little background of our arts district. I lived in it for several years and worked in it for several years. Um, just to give you a flavor of the public art and events that have occurred there. Here are some of the things we're going to cover in our short time together. Here's some site context. Um, so we're, this, we're at the center of the arts district. We're on a big uh, route a big truck route that divides the neighborhood Charles, Charles North. It has high pedestrian and bus rider traffic. It's adjacent to cultural institutions and small businesses. Uh, and I wanna highlight all these to say like, this is a, it's a, it's a meaningful place in the arts district. And we had to balance a lot of different perspectives and stakeholders. Um, and I was really interested in what the engagement process would be for this and how to do that and how to fund it and how to use that feedback to actually um, to, uh, to impact what the design would be. Um, this area in general has a lack of street furniture and softscaping, you can kind of see here, there's some nice brick laid down, um, but a lot of the sidewalks in North Ave are big concrete um, pavement. It has a history of being used for drug dealing with another crime, it has some negative perceptions. So this is like an opportunity to um, enhance the bus rider experience, bring some more texture and greenery and softscaping to the area, create a visual focus for like a major intersection in the middle of the arts district and have a, an opportunity for intersectional engagement with all these different folks who use this area and use this space differently. Um, and as an artist myself, it was an interesting opportunity to think about, uh, I'm also studying planning, I'm an urban planning student. So I really wanted to think about the intersection of transit planning, um, creative placemaking and public art. Um, here's just another view of that area. So it's across from historic site, the North F historic market and this huge public housing um, building although a lot of folks use um, this use the bus on north Ave back and forth to get to to health services to get to the grocery store to get to appointments to get to work um, it's also right in front of the movie theater um, so here are i know this is a lot of words but i just wanted to show you a variety of feedback we got and what's highlighted in green here is what um, our artist uh, public mechanics or Bruce Mellon put together and that's really where we saw some overlap which for me was like oh, okay let's really lean into this we heard from everybody um, bus riders um, like even uh, the Parkway theater folks who were right there um, and Central Baltimore Partnership the organization that was kind of uh, stewarding this project forward that we wanted more seating more street furniture more spread out seating um, a bigger shelter, something that would provide more protection and amenities for bus riders, more greenery, and we want it to be colorful and fun and, um, and match um, the kind of feel of the arts district. Um, from what you saw from the photos before, it's a pretty colorful space. We also found some um, challenges from MTA, and I'm going to go into that. Um, for our artist selection, I just wanted to highlight some of Bruce's past work with public mechanics, the chairs. This was a really beautiful project, and 
partially what inspired um, the stakeholder design committee to select um, this design. So we looked at a bunch of criteria. Uh, we looked, we did an invited RFQ with six artists. Two of those artists were paid to do um, con conceptual designs. Um, and then one of those conceptual designs was chosen to move forward. And right now we are in the design development phase. Um, you can kind of look at that criteria to the right, um, but I want to show you the actual design that was selected. So this is the conceptual design that Bruce put together. Um, and I know that um, for us, it, for the stakeholder committee team and for the partners that we consulted with on finalizing this design, the fact that it had more spread out seating, it, um, it was durable. That was definitely a, a big, um, concern for the owner CBP who became the owner of the site and had to maintain it and had insurance and took that over from the city and from the local transit department. Um, it felt inviting and it referenced um, family living room styles. Um, it, was, it felt scaled appropriately to the site and um, Bruce was very open to working with the landscape designer and viral collab to kind of take this initial bus shelter design and have it incorporate um, landscaping for the entire block. So really going for it. Um, with uh, enhancing the streetscape, pedestrian experience, and the transit experience as well. And then lastly, um, some design challenges that we saw that what you see now is a photo that Bruce uh, shared with me that is in kind of updated design development of how this design needed to change. I think this was really interesting for me as someone who is uh, not a sculptor and an arts administrator to kind of be aware of for future transit projects working with transit agencies um, they were really insistent on having um, the same level of service so initially this design did not have that back wall it was very open and airy lots of visibility lots of room to spread out but they were uh, really insisted on keeping that back wall for protection um, from the elements and then also closing closing that furniture and i see the applause sign and here are some lessons learned that i'll just leave up here and thank you so much uh you know tbd we're still we're still on the way to making this reality, um, but I'm very excited about the trajectory and working with Bruce um, to get this installed. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Laura. All right. Our next presenter is Wendy Raisinem, a curator of exhibitions and collections at Scottsdale Public Art. Wendy, are you ready? She's ready. All right. Here we go. Are we on? Can you see what I'm seeing? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, so my contention is, you know, everybody's excited about public art when it's done and finished, but maintenance isn't something that we think about. Maintenance isn't sexy. The, the life cycle of a completed com public art commission, we all know it takes several years to get a public art commission done. When it's finally complete, everyone's happy. We photograph it. It's shiny. It's gorgeous. It'll last forever. But really, as the art ages in place, is it maintained? We wash our cars, fix the plumbing, repaint the building, but do we do the same for public art? Maintenance is cheaper than restoration and better than decommissioning it. With public art projects all over Scottsdale, the best way for us to keep on top of condition is to do a yearly inventory. We have about 130 projects in our collection and part of our contract with the city of Scottsdale is to do an annual inventory of everything. It gives us the opportunity to do condition reports, make notes, and plan for what needs maintenance. We have a yearly budget of about 140,000, and it covers quarterly, annual, and most unplanned maintenance, but sometimes it's not enough. We have a list of maintenance projects that are over 50,000 to provide the city warning of exp expensive projects for maintaining so they can budget extra for it. We've found that deferring maintenance creates bigger restoration projects down the road. Here's what we're working on right now. These towers of stacked horseshoes have a periodic misting system that has rusted the steel and cracked the concrete inside so they lean out of plumb. After 25 years, the degradation became obvious unexpectedly. The artist is deceased, but we are remaking the pillars true to his vision with real horseshoes. We are improving the drainage and moving the misters away from the back where the water congregates to keep this from happening again. Essentially, we are rebuilding the entire art for artwork for 122,000. Right after we decided to repaint this bridge over Indian Bend Wash, which is a natural floodplain, this pillar was damaged. It's now fixed. 
Uh, we're really not sure how it happened, but the city inspectors took care of it for us. Uh, we used a chyme mineral paint, and it was originally a very dark, rich black, and it was faded and abraded away with the monsoon floods. Power washing, cleaning, and repaint to original color, $53,000. Each piece of this screen's half-inch acrylic is uniquely shaped. One of the panels came loose in a windstorm. Many of these panels develop cracks at their connection points, and with the artist and her original installer's con consultation, we ordered an entire run of new acrylic to replace all of the panels as there weren't any more on hand for replacements. We'll end up with about 25 leftover panels for future repairs. When constructing public art with acrylic or glass panels, be sure to order a large supply on hand for future repairs. Cactus Mirage was designed to screen a pool's slide stairway. Uh, the artwork's stainless steel structure was incorrectly bolted to the painted steel behind it, and 17 years of pool water rusted it and the welded bolts came loose. You can see where the stainless should be bolted to the painted steel. Repairing this adds about $22,000 to the project's restoration budget. We quickly replaced these protective glass panels to try and contain further vandalism. We all know the broken window theory, right? Neglect invites continued damage. Here's an example of traffic calming nodes in a neighborhood where the traffic regularly collides with low decorative walls. This artwork continually draws from our contingency fund in the yearly budget. Three of these glass panels have been damaged and we do not have any more replacement panels. The original commission left us with three replacements, which were utilized in 2009, and this glass design isn't available any longer. JDCA came out to do a site assessment in 2021 for $21,000. They took down a row of glass panels to inspect the connections and the structure, which were fine. Their proposal to replace all the glass was $331,000. The city deferred this funding, so we got another bid two years later, which was over 20% higher. Funding for this has been deferred again. It's an election year, so it'll be a couple more years and we'll ask again. You know where this is going. My, uh, my statement to everyone is invest in your public art. You're gonna have maintenance now or you're gonna pay a lot more later. By the way, we repaint the love sculpture here every year. And that's it. <laughs> Yay, how are you, Wendy? I love that. Maintenance isn't sexy, but it should be. It's very sexy. <laughs> All right, our next presenter is Kryn McMillan, the Performing Arts Coordinator at Arts and MSP, a program of the Airport Foundation for the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. Kryn. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. My screen, let me try that one more time. Uh, okay, can you see that now? Okay, great. Yes, good evening. I'm Corinne McMillan, and um, thank you for the introduction. I'm the Performing Arts Coordinator for Arts at MSP, the Arts and Culture Program for Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport, and I'm also a professional musician myself in the Twin Cities area. So the mission of Arts at MSP is to enhance the image of MSP Airport, enrich the public's experience, and promote a sense of place through arts and culture. Our program consists of commissioned artwork, rotating exhibits, a state-of-the-art, first-of-its-kind cinema inside the airport, and performing arts. I'm here today to share how live music and performing arts can translate to public art, specifically to share about how we do this through one of our newest live music programs at MSP. Arts at MSP is a program of the Airport Foundation, a nonprofit organization that has operated out of MSP Airport for over 40 years. Our purpose is to elevate the travel experience and support the regional aviation community. We do this in a variety of ways, with one of the most visible and impactful ways being through visual and performing arts. 
So Minnesota is home to a diverse and vibrant music scene. We are proud to bring over 1,000 live performances to MSP travelers each and every year. In addition to special performances during high travel times, we also have a regular roster of 20 musicians with a range of styles, including classical, soul, jazz, folk, and more. Our special performances and weekly roster are very well received and highly rated by travelers. Another program run by Airport Foundation is the Animal Ambassador Program, which started in 2015. We currently have over 50 teams consisting of certified therapy animals and their helpers. Animal ambassadors spend most of their time at MSP at one of our designated petting stations located throughout the terminal. So on to the music series we have started, Pet Duets. Last month, we launched this new music series called Pet Duets, a series that features live music and the MSP airport therapy dogs together in one space. It combines two of our existing programs, Animal Ambassadors and the live performers, to create an unexpected and memorable experience for travelers. As you can see here, Pet Duets was an immediate success with some of our youngest travelers in the terminal. The therapy dogs roamed the venue during their live music performances. Oh, I'll go back one. During the live music performances and spent time with each young traveler that interacted with them. Adult travelers were also obviously surprised and delighted by this new travel experience as well. So 15 minutes before each pet duet's performance, we played a professionally recorded terminal-wide announcement letting travelers know about the show. You can see pictured here the impact of these announcements that the particular one on the first pet duet's show had on attendance um, with Nate Hans, our pianist there in the photo and golden retriever Getty. Once the announcement played, we noticed a crowd starting to form in the space. Before long, the seating area was filled with people enjoying the music and waiting for their turn to meet Getty. The mood was light and relaxed. Also there in the upper right, you can see a survey that we hand out um, at these performances to collect feedback from travelers on what they're loving about what we're doing in the arts program and what they would like to see more. These are handed out on guitar picks that the travelers can take home with them and use. We used digital display screens in the performance area that usually serve as flight information screens and displayed information about the artists and about the therapy dogs so that travelers could learn more. These two popular standalone activities, the animal ambassadors and live performances have similar goals, relieve stress during the travel experience that can often feel stressful to so many of us and offer unexpected feel-good moments, exceed expectations, surprise, and delight. We're always thinking about new ways to elevate and maximize our efforts, so we thought, why not bring these two programs together to create a whole new experience? It feels fresh and new, but is simply reimagining things we already do that are well-established and proven to be successful. Although this is not public visual art, we see it as public art and placemaking all the same, as an opportunity to share music, for human connection and a warm and welcoming artistic experience for the traveling public. Thank you. Yay. What a fun combo. I love it. I need to come through MSP just so I can experience the pet duets. <laughs> All right, everybody. We are at our last presentation of the evening. Bruce Willen, who's the artist and principal of public mechanics in Baltimore. Bruce. Uh, hello, everybody. All right. All right. Thank you all for sticking around and making it to the last presentation. Um, yeah, so my, um, yeah, I'm Bruce. I am, <clears throat> pardon me, having some allergies, and I'm <clears throat> also an artist, a designer, musician, educator. Um, I run a studio called Public Mechanics here in Baltimore um, that is focused on projects for uh, public and cultural spaces. Um, today, I'm just going to share a project that I've been working on for about four years. is nearing completion. Um, it's a self-initiated public art project. Um, oh, and also a shout out to Mora for sharing another pro sort of in-progress project of mine. Um, but yeah, so uh, Ghost Rivers is a permanent installation that maps the path of a buried stream 
that runs below the streets of Baltimore. Um, the seeds of the project really started about uh, 10 years ago or so when I, I spotted this uh, creek on a, a vintage map of Baltimore that no longer exists, or I, I should say no longer exists above the surface. Um, this is what Sumwalt Run looks like today. It runs completely through underground culverts. Um, you'd have no idea today that there was a water, waterway running 30 feet below the street. Um, the stream has vanished from living memory. Um, so Walt Run is not alone. There are, across Baltimore, there are dozens of these lost creeks. Um, and in fact, pretty much every city around the world has many underground waterways. So you can kind of still find these ghostly traces of the stream, uh, these sounds of water coming up through storm drains, as well as the sort of haunting ecological consequences that burying these rivers have created. The project involved very extensive research over several years. Um, this, this is one of the archival photos that I found that really illustrates the burial process uh, of a different stream as it's happening. Um, you can see over on the right, this little creek running through a valley. And then these gentlemen are building this big concrete tube through which the waterway now flows. So all, all of these streams were erased from the map, uh, quite literally, um, erased from the landscape. And Ghost Rivers brings the uh, brings Sumwalt Run back to the surface. Uh, the project maps the lost path, the original stream path that the stream once flowed across uh, public right-of-ways, uh, city streams and sidewalks. Um, it follows the uh, path about um, a mile and a half, 12 different installation sites that span an entire neighborhood here in Baltimore. Um, at each site, there, there is this uh, sculptural interpretive signage that I designed um, and also wrote the, the text to, as well as this uh, kind of wavy blue line that is this kind of cartographic gesture that crosses the roads, sidewalks, following the path of the stream. Um, the material for um, this map map line is it's not paint. It's the, the same material that's used for like bike lane decals. So it was developed over um, materials working very closely with Department of Transportation, something that they'd approve. Um, and this also, it's, it's more durable than paint would be. When I was developing the project, uh, I was really sort of imagining it, like trying to think about what might a, a monument or a memorial to a landscape look like. What would uh, you know? What would it look like if we um, kind of wanted to honor or commemorate or think about uh, a lost ecology? Um, kind of like bring it back into memory and as well as think about the past and future of our landscape. So even though the Ghost River is you know it's essentially a conceptual art project, but I I really did want to weave it into the neighborhood fabric very closely. And, and also to try and think about ways to make it as accessible and as gauge, engaging as possible to a wide audience, um, both within the neighborhood and in Baltimore at large. So the, the project, in addition to these physical installations, it really, it takes the form of this kind of history walking tour, um, both self-guided as well as some guided tours that I've been doing with partners, um, as well as this, uh, I built out this like really like super, engaging multimedia website that allows people to experience uh, the project virtually. Um, and all, all of these kind of like additional elements, um, and it created this like much richer process and context than I think would have been possible had this been a commissioned work. Um, this project truly really was like a labor of love that was created uh, in a true partnership with the neighborhood. Um, and this, you know, this research-oriented approach uh, and this multidisciplinary approach has really helped Ghost Rivers become embraced by the community here in Baltimore. Um, for me, as well as for I think folks in the neighborhood, it's given given us an opportunity to peel back these layers of neighborhood history, it's kind of lost ecologies, urban development, and imagine not just the past but also the future of our city landscape. Thanks. Yay, Bruce.
Awesome job. Awesome job to every single person who presented this evening. It was really wonderful. Um, and thank you all for sticking with us um, through this process. You're welcome to stay and chat for a little bit. Um, but if not, if you're ready to go maybe eat some dinner, um, be sure to check out publicartexchange.org. Um, and if you have an idea for a program and you really want to do that, we're very open to having that be possible. So thank you all so much. Let's give a big giant round of applause to everybody. Yes. <laughs> It's so hard to make a presentation in five minutes. Everyone did such a good job. Such a good job. Yeah. I'm so inspired. Hopefully we'll yeah. all be able to take this and keep on with our work. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for anyone or? I had a question. The, um, the project that was trying to increase the uh, diversity of applicants for the public art program. Um, we heard about the increase in applications. I'm wondering if there was also an increase in um, awarded projects. Uh, we're in the process of going through uh, the jury uh, panel selection for the actual roster. So we, uh... We won't know that until June, and um, yeah, I mean, this here, you know, I think you know, part of our equity work here in the city of Seattle of trying to increase the number of you know BIPOC artists who receive commissions. You know, it's always it's always challenging with open calls because you know those who don't know, don't apply, don't get selected. It's always difficult. So at least. You know, we're able to kind of maybe do a little more of more of a curation of when because we will use a roster and we use it in a number of different ways. Whether it's we can create an open invitational to everybody on the roster, or if we know like a specific project, if they're looking for an artist that can do A, B, and C, we'll find the A, B, and C artists, maybe some D, E, and Fs, just to throw it in and mix, just so that and then so we can kind of curate who that is and so i think if it's you know specifically definitely knowing that if it's you know a particular neighborhood where you know people have voiced concerns for you know having bipoc artists we can kind of uh it's a little bit easier for us to make that happen great thank you yep I want to know if anyone besides Stacy has ever had to deliver a project by a barge. That was a really interesting, like, that'll be a fun, like, trivia night <laughs> in a public art bar event one time. <laughs> that was pretty incredible. Yeah. I know Stacey, there was a muted. public art fund project that was years yeah. ago, but. Yeah. That next one is by Mule. <laughs> Hilarious. Some do a project in Wyoming. That's probably what will happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Any other comments or questions? If not, we might. wrap it up yeah well there's tons of comments and questions in the chat so if you were a presenter just read all read all the praise you got before you sign off it's kind of fun and at some point this will be shared um online to um to view again so um you'll be able to see your presentations um or for those that had to cut out a little early or um so but thank you all. Such a good night. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thanks much. for organizing. Yeah, thanks for all the organizational work. No small feat. Yes, thank you.